map nature of the container. So yeah, this is number theory. Um, the, um, I think the prerequisite for this class is basically just a familiarity with proofs. Um, I do intend in the last about two, th about last third of the course to sort of extend um, past the abstract algebra course. But the fact of the matter is, if you haven't had abstract algebra, I don't think it's really going to be a big deal. Um, oh, okay. But whether, whether or not you have, I think that the material is, is actually pretty self-contained. And, um, oh, okay, good. Good. So some, some of the stuff that I'll say on occasion in here will be a bit of a review. Um, Audric, did you have abstract yet? I can't remember. Yeah. You did. So, okay, so I, I am uh, preaching to the choir then. That's good. But um, yeah, we'll be mostly using elements of number theory by Stilwell and, um, and, and a little bit loosely though. I, um, last time I taught this course in uh, 2015 somewhere else, um, I followed this book pretty closely and it's okay, but um, it has a certain sort of duplication of ideas and it doesn't go as deep into some of the um, sort of preliminary materials I'd like. So I'm going to go, kind of go my own way a little bit. I'm some, somewhat following this, but not closely. And um, on occasion I will assign homework, but on occasion I won't um, from the book. Um, for example, I think the first homework, which I'm in the process of writing at the moment, uh, is, is going to be sort of just you guys answering questions that I won't answer today. Like I'll get to something and I'll say like, I'm gonna make a homework problem about this, um, that sort of thing. Um, but um, just to give you a snapshot of the course, um, well, I think we'll have three tests. Um, they're gonna like worth like 15% of your grade, each one of them, so 150 points. And um, <laughs> and uh, <laughs> thanks, Audric. And um, what was I saying? Yeah, 150 points. So I, 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 my, uh, it's a holdover from my previous institution, but we had to have a thousand points in all our courses. So I'm just, as a point of personal inertia, I'm still on this thousand point nonsense. Um, so I have like 150 points for uh, test one, test two, test three. They're all 150 points, and then I probably have some bonus. So if you can earn more, and if you earn more, then you keep it. Um, and then I think homework. I'm gonna make something like 25% here, so you can earn 250 points from homework. Um, and again, the homework is probably going to be a mixture of things from the book and things I just write. Um, I will at times give handouts. Like the whole last third of the course is going to be a handout for my course notes. Um, uh, and basically that last third of the course is about, about ring theory and some just sort of basic ring theory because I, I think it's discussed in Stillwell, but it's not done systematically. And um, so I think that's one of the deficiencies of this text is he tends to have tends to have definitions in the middle of paragraphs and they're not really set out. And I don't, I don't think it's helpful. I mean, it makes for a nice story, but it doesn't make for nice homework doing. And um, I want you guys to have definitions for the things we do in here. Um, and then what else? And then there's a final, yeah. Any, any questions? No? Okay, cool. My, um, so um, I will send a course announcement out that has like my office hours and such. And uh, I have a website, a personal website I maintain independent of the university. And, and there I have actually a, a course website that I maintained from last time I taught the course. And there I have homeworks that I assigned out of here. Um, last time, I don't, I don't have solutions, but I have sort of a list of problems I previously assigned. I don't know if that really helps you or not. I also have um, the three tests I gave last time I taught the course along with solutions. That's partly relevant, but not entirely because we will go a different way, but so, yeah. All right, so what's number theory, <laughs> right? So what I want to start with is just sort of a uh, completely unfair and um, disjointed history of number theory. I have to preface it by saying it's completely unfair and disjointed, otherwise I will get raked over the coals and comments on YouTube from all of the various nationalities that I'm neglecting. 
Because the fact of the matter is numbers are pretty much there as soon as there's civilization. And if you go back to ancient civilization of any kind, you're going to find number theory. Um, so, so here's, a, again, a partial list. Babylonians. So Babylonians. And this is about 1,800 years before Christ. Um, these guys, they looked at, for example, Pythagorean triples. Right? What's a Pythagorean triples? So something like, you know, you have a squared plus b squared equals to c squared. Then a Pythagorean triple is something like abc, such that that holds, right? Now it's not just, I mean, abc, I should be, I should be clear, you know, numbers. In, in, in this context, counting numbers, right? Like one, two, three, four, and so forth. Um, so, uh, okay, so like for example, here's one. Uh, what? Let's see if I do four, I do three, I do five. There's a Pythagorean triple, right? Because four squared plus three squared is five squared, right? Do you know how to get another Pythagorean triple from this? So I'm adding m squared minus m squared, m plus m squared. Hmm. So if you take uh, two integers, you can form a Pythagorean triple by those three equations. Oh, oh, so yes, you're, you're, you're skipping ahead to the, uh, let's see, who's that from? Who, is the, who are those from? It might be Euclid, yeah. Uh, I do have that later. Who's that from? You and your studying. You have interrupted my flow. Um, how, how dare you? Yeah, that was my point. Um, I was looking for something a little bit more lowbrow, which was you can just dilate the triangle, right? Any which way you like. Multiply by, like, rescale by two. And you get, you know, eight, six, ten. Or you could do other things like multiply by three, right? And this is these are obviously not the scale, right? <laughs> All my triangles are kind of the same, and I don't think any of them are actually a three, four, five triangle. Um, but it is kind of impressive, right? 225 is obviously 144 plus 81, says no middle school student, right? Um, I mean, 64 plus 36 is 100. That, that's kind of, but you can see how this can get you know, get you increasingly larger triples. Um, so the, the, the Babylonians were aware of that, but they were aware of something much more complicated, which you were just talking about, Audric, which we'll get to. And I do think, I think you're right, it was Euler. Excuse me, oh. Euclid. A little, little older. <laughs> Too many E names. Let's see here. Yeah, Euclid. This, um, you know, about 350 to 450 BC, somewhere in there. I'm not saying he lived 100 years. I'm just saying I don't know exactly. Um, so did all kinds of stuff, right? As you know, Euclid's elements are st were the standard for uh, the discussion of high school geometry, basically, for millennia. Um, and so he did tons with geometry, but also numbers. Um, very interested in questions about even numbers and odd numbers. Um, proof that the square root of 2 was irrational um, due to U Euclid. And, um, and yes, he also proved that um, a, any Pythagorean triple could be put in the form of formulas that Audric just said off the top of his head that I, yeah. I'll eventually find as I'm going on in my notes. Um, let's see here. Ah, curses. I wish I could find that. Where did I put that stupid thing? Oh, there they are. Yeah. So what you're, th these ones, x is equal to um, u squared minus v squared times w, y is equal to 2 uvw, and z is equal to u squared plus v squared times w. Um, this describes all um, what we would call Diophantine 
solutions to x squared plus y squared equals to z squared. Now, your homework problem, one of your homework problems, will be to show that if you make x equal to this, y equal to that, and z equal to that, then x squared plus y squared equals w squared. This is a gift of a homework problem because it's two lines of algebra. Right? Now the other direction is much harder. To show, how do you show all solutions have that form? That I don't know actually, right off the top of my head. Although I think I might be able to show you a solution at the end of class, we'll see. Okay. So this is Euclid. I mean, of course he did a lot of things, but um, some of the things I was reading said he was likely a Pythagorean. So there's this, you know, Pythagorean, it was almost a cult, right? Um, they had sort of a religious devotion to numbers and they, in some sense, worshipped them. <laughs> um, much like mathematicians of today. Uh, <laughs> let's see here, Archimedes, um, another person in the story. Now this word I just used, Diophantine, it refers to um, Diophantus of Alexandria, by the way. Um, and this, this character here, something like 200 to 300 AD. All right, so that's about what? Eh, 400, 600 years, about 600 years after Euclid, Theophantus did his stuff. And between those, um, you have Archimedes. So I'm a little bit out of order here. Archimedes actually comes um, between Euclid and Diophantus. But uh, Archimedes, something like 287 to uh, uh, 212 BC. Very interesting. Uh, his grave was kind of forgotten for a time. Uh, I think he's buried in Syracuse. And then they're like searching through some rubble and they find... They, they found his grave, and uh, very, this guy is, very, to me, is very interesting. Uh, I'm surprised that there aren't more movies made about him because his, what he did in terms of mathematics and physics is very interesting. He, um, for example, he wrote a paper that explained how he would count the number of grains on the seashore. It's called the Sand Reckoner. I think we still have copies of it. He invented his own number system to like describe very large numbers. Um, he essentially had ideas of calculus pretty well done. He could approximate things to arbitrary precision. He did things like inscribing um, circles inside pentagon, not, not pentagons, but n-gons to approximate pi, things like this. Um, but he was, you know, he was an incredible intellect. Not just anybody could do it back then, right? We can all do that now because we have these beautiful algebraic notations to make things simple. But in ancient times, it took somebody like Archimedes to do these things. We take for granted what we can do in even Calculus 1. It is only because of centuries of, of brilliant effort. Um, now, Archimedes um, apparently wrote a letter to, I can't say this name, Erasthenes, <laughs> about Archimedes' cattle problem. And in that, um, you actually can find Pell's equation as the describing solution. Now, Pell's equation. And so Pell's equation was thus named by Euler around, I don't know, somewhere in like the 1600s, 1700s, I forget. I'll get to it eventually. Um, but anyway, Pell's equation is something of the form x squared minus um, ny squared equals to 1. And so that kind of equation is actually already in, the de already in the works for Archimedes' cattle problem back then. But it's called Pell's equation because a, you know, a, um, Euler called it that. He didn't realize it actually had been studied quite, quite long before that. Um, now, Diophantus is actually very interesting. A lot of, a lot of the problems which spurred um, people to study number theory, let's say in the Middle Ages or later, are due to Diophantus. Like, Diophantus um, wrote some, like, pretty serious works on number theory that then later people like Fermat looked at, and it inspired their work. Um, so, in some sense, you probably could argue that Diophantus is like the, the father of number theory or something. That, that's probably a case that could be made for that. From just looking at the list of topics that he investigated. Um, I'm sure I'm stepping on someone's toes right now. Now, the other things I read was some people thought, you know, in, in, the, um, in this time period, there was the Greek Empire, right? 
So when someone makes a contribution to Greek literature, it doesn't necessarily mean they're Greek. There's um, some speculation that this Diophantus was actually like a Hellenized Babylonian. Hellenized meaning, you know, Greek. Made Greek. Adopted Greek culture. I don't know what you want to say. Let's see here. Um, now, this Diophantus, his work was later translated by... Um, this character, B-A-C-H-E-T, which is probably Bechet, I don't know, um, in, from, from Greek to Latin in 1621. All right. And um, that's also interesting because this character also... Um, Be Beche, he actually proved what's called um, Be Bezu's identity in 1624, which is actually 142 years before um, Bezu proved it. So we have this habit in number theory of giving things to name, giving names to things for the wrong, for the wrong people. You know, it happens a lot, but we're just going to keep doing it. So my apologies. I'm not going to try to fix the naming of things in here. So that's just a snapshot of the ancient history. Um, of course, um, I, I think if you went back to ancient Indian culture or any of the other ancient cultures which have, which have numbers, which, which have records that exist, you could find mathematicians doing number theory of one sort or another. Um, there's also numerology, right? I have almost nothing to say about numerology, you know, the mystic, attaching mystic significance to numbers. Um, you know, you'll find a lot of that in ancient cultures as well. A good example of that in recent times would be like the, uh, what's that called? The, uh, golden, ratio. the golden ratio. Ah, uh, yeah, people do get... Yeah. I, to, I guess people do sometimes get mystical about that. I, I was thinking more like um, the Da Vinci Code or something. You know. Um. Okay, so less ancient history. <laughs> because I'm, I'm trying to just give you a, um, a quick snapshot of what was done and just some of the big players in the story here. Fermat. Uh, so Fermat, we're talking 1607 to 1655. Obviously AD, right? There's a little bit of a jump there, isn't there? <laughs> Apparently nothing happened <laughs> from uh, 300 AD all the way to 1607, right? My... my there is other things that happen, like algebra, right? Um, in the, um, you know, so that the Arab, Arab mathematicians did a lot with algebra during that time frame and other things. But um, this is where the story of number theory, as it's commonly studied, picks up again. Now, Fermat did a lot of things. I won't write them all out. Um, he conjectured the four square theorem. He has Fermat's little theorem, which we'll study. Um, he studied primes. of form a squared plus b squared. So what's a prime number? A prime number, you know, is a number which only has itself and one as divisors, and it's not, not one, right? So one of the large sort of trends in number theory is looking for primes of a particular type, right? So what, what there's infinitely many primes. Um, but what do, what do they look like? Well, are, I mean, are there primes that look like this? Can you think of any? They're the sum of, um, you know, yeah. 17. 17? So 17 is what equal to what? It's, yeah, 4 squared plus 1 squared. Pretty good. Right. So there's, there's lots of these. And, and he proved that um, a squared plus b squared not divisible by a prime congruent to minus 1 mod 4. Um, well, I'm not, I'm not reading it correctly here. Sorry, my notes are too. Let's see here. Every prime congruent to 1 mod 4 can be written in the form a squared plus b squared. He, um, he used something called the method of infinite descent to prove this claim. Now, don't worry. I'm gonna, we're going to get back into this result and look at it in detail in later lectures. I'm sorry I'm not doing it justice at the moment, but you know, Fermat studied primes of that form, and he had things to say about them. Um, he also studied Pell's equation, 
in the form x squared minus n y squared equal to 1. Um, in a contest with a couple of English mathematicians, Wallace and uh, Bruckner. Um, he did a lot more than this, all right? He, he pushed forward the uh, forefront of um, algebra. Like his work was crucial for people like Newton and Leibniz, just setting the stage for all of the development of mathematics. Like Fermat is an important figure in the history of mathematics. I'm not going to say everything he did. But one of the major things he did also um, was have this little theorem x to the n plus y to the n equals z to the n um, for n greater than or equal to 3 has um, no solutions in the Diophantian sense, no solutions in z. Now, you, you, you'll see this, of course, this is what? This is Fermat's last theorem, as it's called. And I, I think... It's, it's, it's a marginal, it's marginalized. <laughs> right, so he wrote it in the margins of this book, Theophantus, um, what's it called? Uh, oh, come on. I had the name of that book written down here somewhere. Um, Arithmetica, I guess, is the book. So that was that big book of number theory I was talking about. And, and of course, Ferba was studying this book. And in the process of studying it, he wrote things in the margin. One of those things was what, we, what grew to be called Fermat's last theorem. All right. that, and, and you see why that's a natural thing to study for number theorists, right? Because they, this, since the Babylonian times, we've been looking at like Pythagorean triples which is to look for solutions to the same kind of equation, but with n equal to 2 instead of 3, right? And there's infinitely many of these of this form, right? There's tons and tons of integer solutions to that equation. Why, why, why shouldn't there be tons and tons of solutions to this equation when you just have n3 or higher, right? Now, he, he claimed to have a proof in the margin, but we're now very, very, we're fairly sure that he either had tricked himself into thinking he had a proof, which was a false proof, or he was just talking nonsense. <laughs> he did it a lot, yeah. I, yeah, I, I think people have sort of dim things to say about him and Gauss in the same sense, like, oh yeah, well, anytime somebody comes up with some news, like, well, I did that 30 years ago, but I don't know. Like, I'm hesitant to throw too much shade on these great figures because they might well have done that. We just don't, who knows? Like, and it doesn't really matter. But um, Now, first of all, this is wrong without further qualification, right? Because is zero an integer? Yes. And so if I just put y equal to zero, can I, and I pick a z, can I find x such that x to the n plus zero is equal to z to the n? Yes, I just take x equal to z. So there are obviously solutions to this equation. But we're talking about solutions where x, y, and z are I think all non-zero. But that seems to get left out of the characterization of the equation whenever you read about it in popular accounts because they'll just say there's no integer solutions. Well, no interesting integer solutions, we should say. I just think it's important for me to make that comment because if later you're looking at the book and you go, I found a solution, then you might have this deep sense of, what else don't I understand? What else are they lying to me about? You know. I mean, you should question things, right? I know that's not a kind of like not really a popular sentiment in our current culture, the idea that you should question authority. Let's see here, Euler, 1707 to 1783. Um, Euler is um, incredible. Uh, the longer you study math, the more you'll be impressed with what Euler did. Um, in terms of number theory, um, apparently Goldbach in 1729 attracted Euler's attention to Fermat's work. So, 1729, Goldbach attracted Euler's attention uh, to number theory. <laughs> I think that's probably a little bit 
I, I think Euler was interested in number theory probably since he was a teenager or whatever. I mean, I, I think that's not, not quite accurate. But he, he, he said, hey, go look at, you know, uh, Fermat's work. Um, and Euler actually proved many of Fermat's claims. Now, Fermat made a lot of claims. He wrote letters to people about his, about his work. I don't think he, I don't know if he actually taught in a classroom or anything like that. It was more like he was a, you know, like a, a, right. So he, a lot of his mathematics is like just conjectures and claims. I mean, there, I think there are some proofs, but it's not, um, it, it, I don't think it really looks exactly like how we do things today, let's say. Um, but Euler actually proved many of Fermat's claims, um, sometimes in conjunction with Lagrange, who I'll talk about next. Um, he's also responsible for misnaming Pell's equation. Um, he took the first steps in analytic number theory all the way to the Riemann zeta function. We'll talk more about that in a bit. And um, he did some early work on quadratic forms, which uh, foreshadowed the more general theory of what's called quadratic reciprocity, which was proved by Gauss in the early 19th century. So, so I have, this is, this is um, offensive to anyone who's a fan of Euler that I have not written more, but the thing is, you can't stop writing what Euler did. He, he sort of like wrote, he did so much. I just, I can't even explain. Lagrange, 1736 to 1813. You see he overlaps with Euler, right? And um, Lagrange did among, uh, among other things, he proved the four square theorem. I think we'll do that in here. What's the four square theorem? So for the four square theorem was known to like Fermat, Fermat assumed the four square theorem in some of his conjectures and things. Um, and I, I think it, it's probably older than that. I, I, would not, I would be shocked if it wasn't. But the four square theorem simply says that any integer can be written as the sum of four squares, a positive integer. So if you give me n, you can find x, y, z, and let's say w, such that n is equal to the square, the sum of the squares of these guys. This is the four square theorem. If we, do, if we do prove that this semester, what we'll see is interesting. To actually prove that, we um, study quaternions a little bit. And quaternions allow us to derive something called the four square identity, which then allows you to prove this. Um, whether or not we actually do that in class, I'm not sure. <laughs> uh, let's see here. He also studied equivalence of quadratic forms of the form m big X squared plus n big Y squared. And I'm not going to define that equivalence. We'll, we'll eventually, I think, stumble upon it later. But uh, um, again, it's connected to that larger question of quadratic reciprocity. And quadratic reciprocity has to do with describing when a number is a square modulo some other number. You guys already know what modulo means. Fuzzy idea. Like Zn. No, 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 no. Um, it should, in, in abstract algebra, you talked about like Z mod n. mod n, like Z6 is that number system where 3 times 2 is 0. That thing. That thing. So if you study questions of can a number be a square with respect to modular arithmetic, those kinds of questions are answered by quadratic reciprocity. Um, and the story which gets to there is the story of studying equivalence of quadratic forms, which really goes back to questions which were initiated by, like Fermat and others, asking about primes having a particular form. That ends up making you look at these quadratic forms, and it's a long story. But I'm just trying to give you a bird's eye view right now. I'm not trying to really explain it. So if you don't feel like it's been explained, you're right. So. Um, now, now Lagrange, Lagrange also did deep and interesting work in physics. He's responsible. He's the Lagrange of Lagrangian mechanics, um, which is in physics how we do, you know, Newton's equations and curvilinear coordinates and much more. Really, Lagrange 
what he did really laid this, the, 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 the foundation for what much of what is theoretical physics today, honestly speaking. So he, he's a uh, very important figure in the history of math and physics. Uh, then there was Legendre. All these French, <laughs> French names, right? Let's see here. Legendre, uh, 1752 to 1833, and I think when we study quadratic reciprocity, we'll use what's called a Legendre symbol, if I remember right. So he, he had some significant role there. Um, so he stated, he, stated, he stated quadratic reciprocity. He um, either conjectured or proved the prime number theorem. I'm thinking he proved the prime number theorem. Um, he um, did something with Dirichlet's theorem on arithmetic progressions, and um, Legendre actually was able to prove the n equals five case of Fermat's last theorem. So, one down, infinitely many to go. All right. Um, in Stillwell, he proves the n equals three case of Fermat's last theorem. He proves that there does not exist a solution with when you put three here, here, and here that you cannot find an integer solution to that. The way that that's done is um, very, very, very sneaky. So, all right, moving on. And then, of course, my, my history here will end with Gauss. So Gauss, um, 1777 to 1855. He published um, Disquisition, let's see here, I can't spell. Arithmetica, which I think is roughly translated as a discussion of arithmetic. Um, <laughs> in 1798, how old was Gauss in 1798? 21. Um, this was a groundbreaking, deep, and lengthy work where he um, solved many of the problems that had been kind of toiled over by Lagrange and Euler. Um, he, he kind of took the next step further in some of their investigations of quadratic forms through using modular, he introduced modular arithmetic. Um, or more specifically, he introduced the notion of congruence mod n, and he used arguments with congruence to prove, well, what we call quadratic reciprocity, um, and, a, and many other things. Um, but it was a deep and technical work that um, Stillwell explains, basically, you know, Gauss was just, just a beast, and he did this stuff, but he did it in such a way that no one really had insight. He just, they're just technical results that he proved, and then um, it took the 19th century mathematicians, the better part of 50 to 70 years, to come up with concepts which sort of unfolded what Gauss had done in a technical sense. That's, the, well, that's basically the story that Stillwell tells in this book, all right? Um, sort of summarizing. Now, Gauss did many other things, right? Gauss, um, he did many things with basic complex analysis. Um, he did things with like, well, Roderick took elementary differential geometry with me last semester. And so there we saw Gauss was just all over the place. Um, you know, curved surfaces, there's a Gaussian curvature that's due to him. Um, yeah, he did early work in topology. I mean, there, there's, there's really nothing in math that Gauss, and, and physics, yeah, right? Gauss's theorem in calculus three, that's that Gauss. Um, there's, there's very little in terms of the kinds of math that Gauss didn't touch on. Um, now, so, um, <clears throat> this brings me to um, my next sort of big picture comment here. So I, I've given you just a very, very quick snapshot of some of the questions and some of the names of um, major figures in number theory. And we'll keep coming back to these people. That's part of the reason I wanted to just put them in the chronological order so you have some sense of it, you know. Um, but the, the big picture of number theory these days is there's 
essentially two directions you can go. Algebraic number theory. And there is analytic number theory. All right. So algebraic number theory is kind of more where this course is, is centered. All right. Um, analytic number theory, truth be told, requires methods of complex analysis, which we don't have at our disposal. And honestly speaking, analytic number theory, I, I think, personally, I, I think it's at a higher level. Algebraic number theory, essentially, the algebraic number theory will study the semester. It's more or less sort of exploring examples that you might see in abstract algebra in depth to say kind of peculiar and special things about primes. All right, we'll be able to study the particular structure of primes using these various things called algebraic numbers. Um, and we'll take time to just look at algebraic numbers on their own right to appreciate their structure. So I think in terms of number theory proper, that's not number theory. But I think it's healthy and good for you guys to see that even. I don't much care that it's not number theory. I'm not going to be, um, you know, too tied down by that label. Now, so algebraic number theory, um, this has to do with, for example, the reciprocity that I talked about, um, cyclotomics. Uh, eventually, these lead to the construction of a lot of the abstract algebra, especially ring theory we know, ideal theory, valuation theory, um, ultimately leads to the um, extension fields, um, the ideal numbers of Coomer. All right, this is, if you start reading Stillwell, you'll see chapter end after chapter after end after chapter end. He's sort of building up this story explaining who, who uh, Coomer and, and Dedekind were and what they did to solve deficiencies in the structure of algebraic numbers. Um, all of these things sort of fall under the umbrella of algebraic number theory. Um, so, um, <coughs> Eventually, I'll sort of just dot, dot, dot. I don't want to write everything down here. Class field theory is essentially where this is kind of the end point in Stillwell's book. He describes, he sort of gives a sketchy description of what we call class field theory um, in terms of the sh what Stillwell calls the shape of ideals at the end of the book. Um, this was done essentially in 1950. Well, 1900 to 1950 is when that, that mathematics was done carefully. It, although, I guess some of the things Kronecker did in the late 19th century sort of led to that. But Kronecker and, and Eisenstein um, were sort of the, uh, the names you might want to put here. And these are both names that you'll run into if you study abstract algebra, especially ring theory. Um, now, current algebraic number theory... would be stuff like Iwasa. <laughs> Iwa, no, Iwasawa. Iwasawa theory or um, Langland's program. And um, I, I should confess, I'm talking about algebraic number theory and um, analytic number theory as if they're mutually exclusive, this is not actually accurate. There is a interplay between these two different things that is um, sometimes surprising and, and, and always there. Um, but Langland's program, in a, in, here, here it is in a sentence, is, is an attempt to generalize class field theory to non-abelian extensions of number fields. Um, That's the most compact description I've ever found of Langland's theory. I, I, thought, I, I thought I should say it out loud. Um, but I've seen Langland's program define, I've, I read a book on number theory. Um, I think it's, oh, goodness gracious, what was it called? Oh, it's written by a couple of folks at Boston College, I think. Fearful Symmetry, I think it might be. And they describe Langland's program chapters chapters of it, but it, it has to do with 
there's a group that you can construct and there's a duel to the group and it's surprising that it's there and it answers certain questions in number theory and anyway, what I just read to you, an attempt to generalize class field theory to non-abelian extensions of fields, number fields. Once you get to the end of Stowell, that sentence will be something that kind of sort of makes sense. Um, I'll write it down. <laughs> Sorry. An attempt to generalize class field theory to non abelian. extensions of number fields. This is some characterization of Langland's program, which I'm sure doesn't really capture what Langland's program is. Langland's program is the edge of what we know. It is, so have you ever heard of string theory in physics? No? Yes? So, so um, you know, there's this reductionist paradigm. We've, we, we, you know, we, we had atoms, right? And then, and the, why, what, what does atom mean? It means indestructible, right? So primes are kind of atoms for, for integers. You can't further break them down, right? Um, but turns out you can break atoms down, <laughs> right? There's, um, you know, there's the nucleus and there's the electrons that orbit. Um, and then once you get to the nucleus, there's substructure there too, right? There's neutrons and protons. And it goes further still because neutrons and protons break down into quarks, right? And anti-quark pairs and so forth. Um, and then, then the question is, is there anything below that? Is there something below a quark, right? And so rather than look for the thing right below a quark, uh, physicists decided to skip about, ooh, 10 to the 18th magnitude and look for something fantastically a bit more basic and that's strings. Strings, string theory is um, trying to produce all of matter and everything by various resonances in some sort of abstract string. Um, it's not finished. It's like people have been working on string theory since the early 70s at this point. And it continues to be a source of new and novel ideas in physics. It, um, anyway, to understand string theory, you have to understand pretty much all of physics, right? And actually a pretty good bit of math too at this point. Like you need a PhD in math and then some to really understand string theory at this point. I certainly don't. Um, and like when I studied it, it was, you know, 10, 15 years ago. So they've moved on and I mean, if you've seen Big Bang, seen Big Bang Theory, yes. remember there's like these arguments like, we can never be together because I'm for twist, I'm for twister theory of gravity, whereas he's for, oh, loop, loop, loop quantum gravity, which is, which is actually tied into the story of twisters. All right, and then he's well, he's he's for M theory, I think probably, brains and super string theory. Um, sometime after I left graduate school and started teaching. String theory um, found a way to uh, suck in the theory of twisters, <laughs> and like so, string theory has twisters in it now, um, or at least some versions of it do. So they like it's it's kind of like that the thing, or I, I don't know the right sci-fi movie to reference here, but it's something that just keeps like you know eating things and making itself bigger. It's, sounds like a Stephen King, yeah Stephen King novel maybe. Um, so my, my point though is to understand string theory like it's, it's really annoying as a student because you have to understand so much. Um, but as a potential student of theoretical physics, it's very exciting because it seems like that's where the new stuff is happening and it's, it's very challenging. Langland's program is like that in mathematics because in order to understand this kind of abstract number theory, you have to be proficient in all of the like major modern techniques that mathematics has or a good, a good sampling of them. Like um, very, uh, very good theory, very good students of modern number theory need to understand 
like the most sophisticated techniques that there are in mathematics. It's 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 quite daunting, but it also attracts like the most sort of ambitious kind of students in mathematics, um, which was surprising to me. I didn't know there was something like this. I found out about this in the course of. Um, well, I had a student who went on to grad school in number theory, and sort of I read some things after that, and I became aware. Oh, number theory is not just about, you know, triangles and square numbers and funny comments about primes. There are much, much deeper things going on. So analytic number theory uh, is, well, here's a, here's a statement. It is the study, I'll, I'll write it, I'll, I'll write a kind of a definition here. It's the study of the integers by means of real or complex analysis. All right. And another characterization of analytic number theory is that it's more concerned more concerned with estimates um, on size or, den or density as opposed to identities. In contrast, algebraic number theory is all about, all about finding particular algebraic stump structures which make lucid identities. It makes identities natural from the algebraic structure. That is sort of the part and parcel of, of algebraic number theory. Find some algebraic concept, structure, or whatever, that makes these sort of miraculous algebra equations have a source. All right? Um, <clears throat> for example, I won't do it today in class, but in chapter one of Stillwell, he explains these formulas that um, Audrey mentioned naturally pop out of studying um, what are called Gaussian integers. That's that Gauss again. So Gaussian integers are just of the form a plus bi, where a and b are integers and i is square root of minus one. And if you look at those, you can derive these formulas. That is a, a quintessential example of algebraic number theory. It's using algebraic structure to gain further understanding of an identity. All right. Um, but um, analytic number theory, <clears throat> here's some typical theorems. Prime number theorem. Um, the, uh, the Goldbach conjecture. I wonder if that's the same. Is that the same Goldbach as the one I mentioned earlier? I wonder. Is that this Goldbach? <laughs> or is that another Goldbach? I really don't know. Yeah, Goldbach conjecture. I think Goldbach conjecture is also known as the uh, twin prime conjecture. Um, I think I think Tau has pushed the envelope on what we know. I don't think the twin prime conjecture has been proved yet. Um, Hardy Littlewood conjecture. There's something called a warring problem. The Riemann hypothesis is a big one. The Riemann hypothesis has to do with this Riemann zeta function um, and zeros of the Riemann zeta function. Um, tools for analytic number theories include circle methods, sieve methods, L functions, modular forms, automorphic forms. None of these things we're doing in here. Okay. But analytic number theory would be maybe the next course you took in number theory after you'd had some, you know. Um, further, like you really need to be solid in complex analysis. I have complex analysis, I have taught bits of analytic number theory at the end of a complex analysis course, but I found it to be very challenging. Um, now, to an analytic number theorist, it's effortless. So um, I had the good fortune of having an office neighbor, Ethan Smith, who is an honest to goodness analytic number theorist. And um, he actually came and gave a guest lecture. It was easy for him, you know, because he knows all that stuff. Not, not, some of these things are open problems. <laughs> Okay, the proof of them. Do you, do you, so the twin, you know what the twin prime conjecture is? So uh, check it out. So 
11, 13, both primes, right? 17, 19, primes, right? Let's see here. Uh, what else? One eleven, one thirteen. No, no, no. But there, you can keep finding these, right? So the, I think the twin prime, twin prime conjecture has to do with there being infinitely many of these if you go on out. Something along the lines of that. I'm saying something along the lines of that because I have not read it carefully, so I'm not, you know. But it is along those lines, and um, so anyway. All right, so now that I got that history <clears throat> grossly stated here, let us try to move to more um, concrete things, all right? And I'll try to be less sketchy going forward. I mean, I think this bit right here wasn't sketchy, right? But, and that also happens to be where the Homer problem is, so it's not, not an accident. Okay, so what I'm going to try to do now is to just remind you um, some properties of number systems. Actually, I'm really just setting some notation here at the start. So first of all, n, what do we mean by by n in here. So, you know, opinions vary on this, but in this course, n, the natural numbers, is going to be 1, 2, 3, and so forth, okay? No zero. Um, integers? Well, there you got zero, plus or minus 1, plus or minus 2, like that, right? Integers. Um, rational numbers? Q. Uh, P over Q, such that what? Such that P and Q are integers, and Q is not equal to zero, right? Um, then we have real numbers, which I'll just say is minus infinity to infinity. <laughs> so I, I've defined real numbers with another, with another notation for real, real numbers. It's not <laughs> complex numbers. <laughs> So here's a plus bi, such that a and b are real numbers, and i squared is equal to minus 1, right? All right. Let me just make some comments about these. So this is not, not a ring. So, like, there does not exist minus 1 in n such that minus 1 plus 1 equals to 0, right? So, like, a ring, among other things, is closed under um, additive inverses, right? So that means the natural numbers are not a ring. Now, we will define ring carefully some other day, but just throwing the word out there. The integers, on the other hand, is it is a ring. And ring means that it's a set with a well-defined addition and multiplication, which behave normally. Right? The integers are, in fact, an integral domain. An integral domain, what that means is that if you have, the if you have two integers multiplied, and they're equal to zero, it must be that one or the other or both of those integers are zero. You can't have the product of non-zero things be zero. That's what you need for an integral domain. Integral domain is a, well, I should say it's a commutative ring. Commutative refers to the multiplication. Um, now, the last three examples are what are called fields, right? The rational numbers are a field. The real numbers are a field. The complex numbers are a field. Now, rational numbers are, interestingly, the same cardinality as the, um, 
um, the integers, right? They're they're countably infinite. They're not they're not that big in some sense. You can make a one-to-one -one correspondence between rational numbers and and uh, whole numbers if you want um, by just like looking at lowest form for the fractions and kind of like sending them to to the whole numbers. Um, that construction I think is due to like piano if I remember right. Um, this is some 19th century stuff there, but um, then the real numbers on the other hand are much bigger. Um, they're the size of the continuum. So um, to get from rational numbers to real numbers, there's two different ways you can do it. You can, well, there's many ways, but two different ways I think about. Um, you can form what are called Dedekind cuts, or you can use Cauchy sequences um, construct. Dedekind cuts, or you can construct the uh, equivalence classes of Cauchy sequences in Q. In other words, one way to look at the real numbers is it is the completion of the rational numbers. Now that concept of completion is something from analysis, all right? It's not something we're going to do in here, I'm just telling you. It is actually quite an ordeal to construct the real numbers from the rational numbers. That's pretty technical beyond this course. Um, in contrast, constructing the rational numbers from the integers, that's something we will do in here, okay? And constructing the natural numbers, constructing the, the integers from the natural numbers, that's something we'll do in here. That'll be in your first homework, all right? I will show you how that can be done through a homework problem. And in constructing the natural, how can you construct the natural numbers? may never have thought about this, but is there a concrete mathematical model that has all the properties of the natural numbers? It's it's something like that. You need, yeah, there's, you got to find a successor function. Yeah. Um, but I will actually have, one, one of your first homework problems will be on how to construct the natural numbers using th set theory. So I'm, I'm pretty sure it's something you guys haven't seen before. It should be interesting. Um, see, because Every so often you'll run into people who are like, well, how do you know that exists? Well, so it's a somewhat philosophical question, right? What are the natural numbers? What are those integers? What are the rational numbers? What are the real numbers or the complex numbers? You could hang your hat on a particular model of them. I will show you a particular model that describes the natural numbers, describes the integers. But I, I would urge you to not think of them as being that model. You should think of that model as a potential realization. But what the thing actually is, is its set of properties which describe it, you know? The real truth is um, the natural numbers are really the thing that it, um, satisfies these axioms of piano. Or you, know, you can, there are various axiom systems which describe the natural set of numbers. You should probably instead of think of the natural numbers as being something that satisfies that axiom system. Like, like the real numbers, it's something that satisfies the axioms of the real numbers. It's not necessarily the set of Dedekind cuts or the set of Cauchy sequences, um, like complex numbers. I could also give you homework problems constructing complex numbers, all right? But I think instead I'm just going to show you here right now. So just to try to bring some life into what I'm saying. <clears throat> so complex numbers, what was a complex number? Well. C can be modeled by two by two matrices of form A um, minus B, B A. So you could think about that as being quote unquote equal to A plus I B. In this way of thinking, I is what? I is equal to the matrix 0, minus 1, 1, 0, right? If you just plug it in. What happens when we multiply I times I? 